down to the well. Often focus, because often we focus on the outward beauty of the body or outward beauty uh, of environment or in some related area that is dear to us, muscle cars or this or that or the other thing. Um, and it's interesting, in Western culture, beauty going all the way back to the Greeks and Romans uh, in, uh, for example, the, the 5th century B.C., uh, Pythagoras, the guy who thought up the Pythagorean theorem and stuff like that in mathematics, they were putting, they were thinking about beauty in terms of proportion and symmetry. So later on we see uh, Greek and, and Roman architecture, you know, everything's kind of, you know, the big columns and everything's kind of even, Stephen, you know, and all of that. And that was their sense of what was uh, beautiful. That progressed in Western culture and uh, even towards the 13 to 1600s in the Renaissance, they started talking about fittedness or propriety or what's appropriate and order and harmony was allegedly beautiful. You can even see that in some of the, the music, you know, the symphonic music that was going on uh, during uh, those days, the development of the symphony and stuff. And if you look and you've studied any of that stuff, it's kind of, you know, it's got forms. I remember when I was studying music theory at UC Davis, uh, my prof said, you know, you, you, you move too many directions too quickly, you know, because there was a form and that sort of fittedness and order. Um, in the age of reason, 1620s to 1780s, the Enlightenment, they started to think about beauty in philosophical terms. So they started seeing, you know, beauty was, or discussed beauty being uh, um, um, unity in diversity and diversity in unity. And some of that was sort of beautiful. And then the moderns and postmoderns, it goes kind of wacky and more arbitrary and, and random. There was even a time in the last century when when people were saying there's no such thing. In the academic communities and the philosophical communities, there is no such thing as beauty. I was thinking, get a life, would you? We all know there's beauty out there. We might not put our finger on it, or it might be a little squishy, but we know it. And sometimes we have this sense that it's bigger than just a, a handsome man or a beautiful woman. All of that to say there is along the way, there has been some emphasis on the aesthetics of beauty, which is wonder and awe and marvel. And sometimes there's a press to internal qualities, not so much these days but in terms of personality, charm, social graces, uh, uh, intelligence. Some of you are watching Downton Abbey. That was an era, the Victorian era, where beautiful was propriety and, and all of that, you know, and we've, we've kind of watched it. It's really interesting to see that culture's sense of what is beautiful and, and, uh, and such. All of that, though, there's this sense of external uh, and physical. Well, that said, what I want us to really focus in on today is beauty defined biblically, which brings us actually to a much deeper and fuller understanding of beauty. And I think you're going to find, number one, you're probably experiencing some of it already. And I think you can go deeper and higher uh, with it. And in that, you will find great release because it's going to relieve you from competing if you don't have the best looking body or, you know, I'm not even wearing skinny jeans today. You know, I'm a bell-bottom guy because I graduated high school in 67, you know, uh, in Richmond, California. So let well, me see. We have sort of our taste buds shaped in those areas. Two things I want you to remember about the Bible as we move. Just in review, the Bible is God's revelation to humans about the way reality works. Got it? The revelation to humans about the way reality works. It's not just a religious book. It's not just for some little private sector stuff. It's talking about all of life. And the second thing is the Bible's perspective is that life doesn't work right without God being smack dab in the middle. That's why even church stuff won't work right unless God really is in the middle. I know God's somewhat in the middle of your church. You know why? I hear a lot of laughter. And there are a number of studies and research in church health and church growth that say where laughter is high, there is health. And that generally means there will also be growth because people want to come. The, the, the church is a hospital, but people want to come where they think they can get a little healthy. And they're not having people poking at them and all that kind of stuff. But they're seeing the liberation and the healing and the health of God. And that draws them. And that's happening here. I know that. Okay, that's it. Therefore, we sh shouldn't be surprised that the 
Bible's explanation of beauty has all to do with the reality of God expressed through the intersection of His holiness, His virtues, and His love, all of which actually are virtues. And, and so sometimes that leads us to the big idea today that beauty is the intersection of God's holiness, virtue, and love with reality. So it's not just religious, is it? Sometimes, if you understand, I'm talking about that beauty is sourced in the reality and the holiness and perfection of God, which Jonathan Edwards says is primary beauty. All uh, created beauty then is secondary beauty. But if, if you understand that, that, that the holiness of God manifested through the virtues that things we call virtues, which are really ultimately from God, and uh, one of the most important and powerful virtues, that is love, pure love, um, sacrificial love, that those, when that dynamic, or you could say virtue and reality intersect, you're going to have beauty. I hope that is going to be a liberating definition for you. And I challenge you to look to see how the Bible reveals that all through its pages. And it ultimately culminates in the beauty of God's holiness, his virtues expressed through his loving work in sending Messiah to care for our sin problem and give us access back into right relationship with him, his healing and his health and his destiny. That's big, isn't it? Amen. That's like really big. See, God has a claim on our life, but you have to be wrestling with another reality, and that is that God is real and God is relational. And you've got to keep coming back to that because we keep thinking our spiritual life is wrapped up in committees or church attendance or this or the other thing. No, 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 no. And I know your pastor is going to say the very same thing, even though you've got a lot of programs and activities going on here. The ultimate issue is this minute by minute, daily worshiping companionship walk with him, just like Jesus demonstrated. Amen. And why he gave the religious community such heartburn. He just kept moving in the reality of life with God, in the realm of the Spirit, in line with the revealed Scriptures. So he didn't do anything wacky. But actually, his perfection was wacky because most everybody else is wacky to some degree <laughs> or another. All that to say then... Let's kind of open this up. Uh, here, David was marveling over the reality of God's realness and his relationality when he was talking about Psalm 27, 4. David was reveling in the fact that he knew God existed and that David was experiencing God's guidance. If you'll look at 27, verse 1 in that psalm, he's got God's guidance in past situations in his life. He had God's salvation. Salvation. And probably David was talking not only about saving his soul, but saving his tukas. That is, I mean, he was being chased by bandits and soldiers illegitimately, and God literally saved his life. Uh, it's 27.1. He had protection, 27.2. He had a sense of an involvement with the presence and the power of God, 27.3a. And in the midst of desperation and troubled times, God intervened intervened on his behalf. He knew it was real. And you know what? That was beautiful. So the one thing that I ask, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the presence of God all the days of my life. And I'm not sure he wrote this in the temple, to tell you the truth. So he was also outside of the temple or the tabernacle when he wrote these things. And gaze upon his beauty, a love relationship. And this is long before our issues of charismatic, non-charismatic. Get over that, people. This is something far deeper. This is going into the reality of God. He's as real as you are. And we have a relationship right now. It's not a bottle of water, but it's real. It's a transcendent reality. There's a relationship. 
And when I prayed for this church over the last six years, I'm not saying it's all my fault, but I'm saying my prayers counted in moving in Randy's and Christie's lives and in the lives of your church. And just as you pray for other people, and quite frankly, that has nothing to do with being famous or not being famous. That has nothing to do with having degrees or not having degrees. That has to do with being in relationship with God. You count. I had a couple, I had somebody in Moscow praying for me this morning. You don't know her name. She's not famous. She's one of our staff people. And it wouldn't matter if I told you her name. But Bev is out there praying for you and for me. Amen. How about that? You can do that too. I know you know that. All right, now in that direction, it's the same dynamic with Psalm 96.9. Where it says, uh, I'm going to go in 8, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord Yahweh in the splendor or beauty of His holiness. How about that? Tremble before Him all the earth. And I don't think it's a tremble like, Oh, He's terrible. It's like being at a U2 concert. Oh, God, oh, God. You know, that kind of thing. It was like we saw when the Beatles first hit, you know. That was not a trembling of badness. That was a trembling of goodness. And that's a very dull illustration. But man, when you come up, you smack up against the true and living God. It's better than smacking up against your famous movie star accidentally at the Los Angeles International Airport. And what would you go? You would... <gasps> Delight, delight, marvel, marvel, uh, coolness, coolness. You, you see? Whoa. You know, that is a dynamic of worship. Now, let me just really quickly say, worship in its generic form is whatever we admire, desire, pursue, and serve. Admire, desire, pursue, and serve. That's sort of generic worship. Do you do that for the Lord? One could say that the essence of worship is finding my deepest satisfaction in God beyond anyone or anything, anybody else. I'm not there, but I want to be there. Where are you? Do I find my deepest, deepest satisfaction being in the pursuit of God or something else? I started asking that question as I moved. Now, it seems like David here it understood to worship the Lord in the splendor or the beauty of his holiness. So we need to think of a couple of things. What is holiness? Oh, boy. Uh, what is holiness? And, and uh, uh, we've dealt a little with beauty. Let's just take a look at it now. In point number one on your, on your outline, I want you to know that beauty, what we've talked about, the big idea is beauty, I'm suggesting to you, is the intersection of God's holiness, virtue, and love. And the first point here I want to make is God's holiness is a reference point for all other beauty. God's holiness is the reference point for all beauty. David writes in 96.9, Worship the Lord in the beauty or the splendor of His holiness. So two things. Number one, what is the meaning of holiness? It's the word kadesh or kadosh in the Hebrew. It means other than, set apart, separate, or separateness. And it has a sense of highness to it. The implied sense is purity, perfection, and virtue. And as such, it, it connotes the reality of being utterly distinct, one of a kind. Some of you will remember Bob Beeman jumping 29 feet in the long jump in 1968, four feet longer than any other human being had ever jumped. It was human. It was in the realm of the natural, but it seemed super human. Um, right now, I, it would, if, the, if the Nashville, Tennessee Titans have won a game, it would be super human. Uh, I think they're the worst in the NFL. You know, but, but we see these, these people out there. And, and when we wrestle with God, and you've got to wrestle with this, this is not going to come on automatic pilot. Right? Lord, I need, to, I need you to help me understand more directly uh, you know, what's going on there. That, that God is high. 
and distinct. And in that, there's a dynamic of fear, but it's a delighted fear. It's like getting a backstage pass for me to a Paul McCartney concert. You know, I would be a cautious propriety. I would want to look cool and not open my mouth too much and get kicked out, but I would be delighted. How cool is that? Matter of fact, cool. The word cool is a worship word. It has to do with reverence, awe, marvel, affirmation of value, appreciation, all those things. That is cool. Well, just know that you're worshiping with that word. And it's also a beauty word. How cool. How beautiful. It would be appropriate. Wrestle with those little things and, and ask God to reveal to you his reality in the context of reality and you will begin to find that kind of thing. And there's awe, delight, um, splendor, and beauty. The meaning of beauty in the Bible, there are several terms. Psalm 27.4, it were, uses the Hebrew word noam, which means pleasantness, delightfulness, favor. You know, the other day, I, I've got two kids, one of them has uh, uh, in uh, the husband and wife, and they've got four children. They were over at the house the other day, and uh, three, five, ten, and twelve. Everybody was in the front room. Everybody was doing something. Everybody was happy. Uh, I mean, like the parents, the grandparents, and the kids, and everybody kind of did like you know for a little moment in Camelot. And I, I got choked up. I mean, nothing was going on, except everything was going on, and it was what. Beautiful. This sense of moral purity, holiness, otherness, coupled with virtues, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and such. And it all converged in reality. It was not a religious moment. It was a real moment. And it was beautiful, and it caused me to choke up and praise God and affirm Him. Good night, was I worshiping? Yes! <laughs> Probably better than in some church services where I'm going, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm not sure it's happening. Do you see? And it was a thing that snuck up on me because I've been asking God to open my eyes and do it supernaturally because I can't grunt this into operation, and neither can you. See, but it's wrestling with him. It's interacting with him. Yes, it is quiet time and things like that, but it's beyond that. Now, point two, I've got to go really quickly because I think